You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. Island View with hosts Teresa O'Leary and Marshall Freeze. Welcome to Island View, a weekly current affairs show about Gabriola Island. I'm Teresa O'Leary. This week we listen in on a tense debate over a development permit at the most recent meeting of the Local Trust Committee. And I'm Marshall Fries. This coming Saturday, September 30th, is a federal holiday created to focus on truth and reconciliation in Canada. Here are statements made by the trustees on this important day. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I always feel funny about coming to another island and saying, welcome to the Gabriella Island Local Trust Me, because I'll just welcome myself. You guys all live here. <laughs> and it's just a real pleasure for me to be able to come here and be in your community. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Peter Luckham, I'm elected on the Sound, chair of Trust Council, and chair of the LTC here. And it's a beautiful, believe it or not, early fall day. And I'm uh, so grateful for that. Um, of course, we're here meeting in Sanaimo uh, territory and uh, all up and down the uh, just area where I live, my accident in Malkin territory um, every day. That's meaningful and important to me. And I think that we all need to reflect upon um, the place that we live and occupy and play and love and everything that we do. And, uh, and that indeed the history here of the colonial settlement has not been. Um, very kind to nations, but we were welcomed so warmly with open arms. And so let's always consider that. Um, with me today, today, of course, is your locally elected trustees, Susan Ames. Thank you, Chair Lacan. I would also like to make an acknowledgement, an acknowledgement. Um, do you want to go first, Toby? Okay. Thank you. So last month, I had the pleasure of attending the Sunshine Coast Festival of Literary Arts. And two authors I heard, First Nations authors. One was Angela Sterrett. Some of you may know her as a CBC reporter. And her book is called Unbroken, My Fight for Survival, Hope, and Justice for Indigenous Women and Girls. And it was such a powerful presentation that many in the audience left weeping. And then the next day, I was so fortunate to see Jody Wilson Rabel talk about her most recent book called True Reconciliation, How to Be a Force for Change. So they were, I really took a lot back with me from those presentations, but significantly for the work that we do for council, um, for the Honest Trust Conservancy, and for our local trust committee, when asked by audience members what non-Indigenous people should do to honor reconciliation, Ms. Sterrett responded with some urgency, stand up and say something when you witness racism. She also reminded people in the audience, which were, yeah, the audience were several hundred, by the way, it was a pretty big venue. She reminded people to believe our story. That was great. So with the beginning of the school year, I'm back volunteering at the school again. And I think about what First Nations elders and parents, how they would have passed on their knowledge to their children. That seems really important to me. And I think about my obligations to future generations quite often when I'm at school and about being a better ancestor. Um, and maybe about sharing stories with children that help us be better ancestors to think about ways that we can care for each other and for this place that we call home. 
Um, as if we truly belong here, as if we truly belong in this place. Toby. Good morning, everyone. My chair, welcome. My name is Toby Elliott. Um, and thank you for that beautiful acknowledgement introduction. Um, I as well want to affirm support for not only the Declaration Act that BC signed into law in 2019, but the Islands Trust's own reconciliation declaration signed in this room in uh, March on March 14, 2019, in which our organization committed to a path of acknowledging the wrongs, the historic wrongs that have been committed and the decision making that has been done predicated on a faulty and flawed understanding of underlying rights and title in the territories of the more than 30 nations uh, in the Islands Trust area on whose land we live and work and play. And when I was campaigning to be elected to this body last year, I wrote a reconciliation mandate for myself. Uh, September 2nd, 2022. And I'll just read out a portion of it if, if to, with your indulgence, because it is what guides my decision making. And I read it through this morning, and it's still true today. It's like, I was like, oh, this is my North Star. This is what will be my bedrock in decisions that are when it gets tough. So I fully support the trust commitment to reconciliation and deepening relationships with First Nations people. The current trust policy statement, which guides community processes and decision making, has never acknowledged the rights, concerns, or ongoing relationship with Indigenous peoples with the lands and waters in the trust area. I fully endorse the work done, the work being done by the current term of trustees, this was last term, to rectify this and bring the trust policy statement into alignment with the TRC's calls to action. It is critical that the very special relationship that's the name of the First Nation and other First Nations have to Gabriola, Mudge, and to Corsi is protected and supported in practice as well as in law. That Indigenous rights to access their sacred areas, burial sites, harvesting areas, and places of spiritual significance and renewal on the islands are respected. I would work to ensure all agencies and ministries conform to heritage protection for sites that are significant to Sinema First Nation and follow the conservation policies and principles as outlined by the Islands Trust and First Nations governments and now Declaration Act. And I'll close with the words of uh, former trustee Dan Rogers, who was chair of this LTC, and some remarks he made March 2021 to Trust Council, <clears throat> because I think they get to the metal of the principles that guide our work today. <clears throat> our commitment to reconciliation comes not from a dictate or directive in the act, but rather from the legal and moral imperative to recognize and understand the history of this area, to reject colonial attitudes and to travel the path to reconciliation. The trust has been remiss in its history of recognizing the history and heritage of indigenous peoples in this area and has set about on a path of understanding and reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. This Sunday, the Gabriela Museum will be presenting a talk by Elder Geraldine Manson of the Snamo First Nation about her new book. Up next, we present a heated discussion from the last meeting of the Gabriola Island Local Trust Committee over a development permit application from Center Stage Holdings. Um, so trustees, um, here we are um, with this report the second time around and the recommendations. Um, Yeah, I will just say I think that uh, what's indicated in our report is that the applicant is, is meeting the requirements of the development permit, and um, uh, there's a certain obligation to um, uh, issue that permit. So let us see where you're at today. Um, do you have any questions for staff or the applicant? 
Good question. Yeah. So, um, what triggered this development permit application? Was it logging in 2020? Uh, originally, we received an application for subdivision under a layout that is not currently being contemplated any further. So, the year we stuck might have been 2020. Um, so, we indicated in our subdivision referral response to the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure that a development permit was required. For this deep slope development permit area, because they have initiated an application for some division. That application is now closed, so it's not proceeding with that laid out. So the applicant has come back to request a development permit, regardless of the subdivision, uh, to do pre removal specifically. But the previous one was for some division. This is for tree removal. So the applicant was advised to submit a separate. Application for that, and that's in the supporting documents. For it. But my question is was it triggered because there was already logging taking place? And what's the name of First Nation wrote a letter saying they were concerned that there's evidence of disturbance and that they would like all development to stop until they have secured the covenant areas with the applicant. That was the one EP was initiated as part of the center. Application in 2020. Yeah. So subsequent to 2020, there was then a letter from Sonema Wise, 21. And then this LTC wrote a letter back for, in response to the subdivision referral from Boti, stating that the LTC could not support approval of the proposed subdivision until an Unless and until the interests and concerns of the Sonoma First Nation are addressed and they have given their consent. Mm -hmm. That was related to the subdivision, correct? Yeah. So I do understand that we're not talking about subdivision, but the larger question of the covenant areas that really are at the core of Sonoma's concerns mm -hmm. are still with the ministry. And according to the applicant, there has been a new archaeological assessment, new-ish. Chief Wise has written in his letter of 2021 that the park assessment uh, that had been done was inadequate and they were, were you know, wanted to see a new one. So that's all pending. That covenant area is still pending with the province. Correct. And I understand that we can't weigh in on that process. We don't, nothing apparently to do with this approval. But it's very clear from the maps that the geotech areas that are mapped, especially slope B, this forest dam B, directly overlays with the really sensitive areas that have been identified for protection um, and that are still apparently a synonymic is not in agreement that those areas have been defined and protected under covenant. Mm -hmm. So the map overlays with burial cairns. I've seen all the letters that I believe synonymic have written from 2005 up to 2021, and their objections are consistent in that until protection of these cultural heritage sites is assured, they do not consent to any development. And it's in fire lot. And my question to this LTC is do you support A, the letter from the previous LTC? But and I know you have seen have it to Nikki Schneider. Um, and our referral response wrote that we are aware of special concerns expressed regarding this particular application by the Sunan First Nation. It acknowledges our reconciliation declaration and admits that our commitment has evolved the way that the trust views land use decisions. 
So the name of First Nation is a strong nation that says we use consent based process. It is not enough to consult. It's important that we do have consent before you do anything. And they've laid out very clearly their referral process, which in a further application, BC Ferries has followed. And we'll see what that referral process looks like. Laid out very clearly by the lands trust or the lands clerk, Desiree Thomas. So their process is clear. Our process is not. And our process is purporting to put a development permit ahead of these provincial agreements to secure covenanted areas of extremely sensitive cultural heritage that have not been agreed upon or signed yet. And until we see that sign off from the province that those areas are secure, I would not be comfortable moving ahead with this application. Not comfortable. I would not agree to advance this application. I would prefer that we defer it until that security is obtained. Okay. Um, I would like to ask a question. Um, How is it that this covenant on archaeological uh, archaeological site, you say hypothetically, archaeological site, potential covenant, which I don't know anything very much about in this particular case, archaeological sites are protected by provincial statute or um, What effect would the covenant have that would further protect those? Um, and how does that interact with our development permitting, development area permitting process? So the covenant, future covenants for the ARC sites uh, under our referral response to MOTI, the Ministry of Transportation, we have suggested uh, generous buffers be included as part of the covenant areas and that that distance be determined in consultation with the First Nations and the applicant, because we're not the experts. We have nothing in our land use bylaw that stipulates what that should look like, and the province is squarely responsible for the protection of those sites. But we understood it in conversations with the nation that that would be one significant approach to ensure that there's buffers around the recorded sites that restrict future property owners if the subdivision were to be completed. Um, from undertaking activities that could not necessarily impact the site itself, but have detrimental impact on access to the sites or other factors. So that the covenant would be able to allow for a larger area for, perhaps to be protected on top of the recorded park sites. Already existing layer of protection through the provincial legislation. Um, the covenant is also a tool, it's a restrictive covenant in nature, so in British Columbia we can use these restrictive covenants to also impose other obligations on future property owners that perhaps the heritage um, branch may not be able to under their own legislation, so it could add an extra layer of protection. So at the time of subdivision, we anticipate that that covenant, covenants, would um, be more robust than the existing level of protection that's afforded to any archaeological recorded site under the current legislation. So that hasn't been finalized because that subdivision layout is pending. The number of lots, the location, access, driveway, septic, wells, all those details are now back to the applicant to provide clarification and then a referral to us to provide comment back to the province. So that's my understanding of how those covenants will eventually work is that they work, they're registered on title, they run with the land, any future land owners then have a clear sense of not just, um, you know, if, they're, if those lots are um, encumbered with the 
covenant, and they are able to be purchased in the future as these simple lots, then that information would be well established at the time of purchase what the limitations are for development on the property. Having said that, we understand that the applicant is working to ensure that all the known and recorded archaeological sites will hopefully be contained within one parcel to reduce that risk of further fragmenting those recorded sites across multiple titles because they do have up to 14 lots uh, subdivision potential for that property. So you get all the known park sites, the recorded sites that we have. What about unknown, um, which are still an issue of concern for Senate? So the applicant's most recent um, uh, archaeological impact assessment that was submitted to the province indicated uh, that there were no new additional sites that needed to be um, uploaded to the, the database of the sites. So that's the potentially the information that Trustee Elliott's referring to in terms of some discrepancies. Uh, and that's to do with the province accepting that report and the findings within that report and the nation's conversations. We don't have anything to do with that particular process. Um, so I can't speak to the validity of the data that the province will have to consider at this time's definition. Your development permit application guidelines do not take into account any of these factors. See, we're, we're discussing matters that are completely outside the scope of the DPA, but I understand how we're going to But you understand the, 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 the layers are literally one on top of one another. And so in the geotechnical report, which was just from May, where they divided up into seven slope areas, and slope area B is very small, and 175 trees are proposed to be taken from that area. And that is the exact area where six or seven significant cairns, burial caves, and the significant arc sites that the nation has said repeatedly, there is nothing that is more important to us than the protection of those specific sites it is in that very small band that your geotechnical report say 175 trees can be taken down somehow safely without causing slope instability. And we're made to believe that somehow the arc sites are going to be protected when the nation has very specifically said, we want to be alerted two weeks in advance before any development happens so that we can have somebody from our nation on hand to supervise. That's right. And if they require a heritage alterations permit because they would be working within those sites, then the applicant and the geotech were well aware that that would be the case, that there's been no indication that they would be removing any vegetation within or directly adjacent to those sites. And that's referenced in the staff report is that if that were to be the case, yes, that triggers the provincial process of which there might be numerous requirements that the applicant has to meet, including having an on-site um, archaeologist or monitor, but that's not the case. Uh, based on this application, there's no indication that there would be any trespass into those uh, recorded site boundaries for the purpose of treatment. So stand type B that sites 175 trees are somehow not going to disturb the arc sites. What is the assurance? Uh, so as in anywhere on Viverula Island, the assurance is with the homeowners and the property owners conducting the work to abide by the provincial legislation. And if they are going to go into those areas that they do have to apply for heritage alteration. So it is up to the applicant's word that they will go do their due diligence. That's the way the whole process operates. Okay, and so what we've been told and what and my understanding is that the nation keeps saying, don't do any development until we secure these areas. And so all I'm suggesting to this LTC is we cannot approve any development because the higher authority needs to be satisfied in terms of securing the covenant areas. There's just no getting around it. So I don't know if this is helpful or not. At the time of rezoning in 2005, <clears throat> there was approval of the rezoning and the density for that lot in excess of the 14 lots that are currently outstanding. 
And the entire political understanding was that the subdivision application was the point in time in which this level of detail was going to be dealt with. They, they deferred all of it to that stage. And unfortunately, that stage is now, and it wasn't concurrent with the rezoning. And in some cases, that means we have an opportunity for a better final subdivision layout because so much has changed in that time. So the subdivision application is not even on our table or on our application list. And that is, we know that's coming back to us. And that is the point in time in which there is so much more robust analysis in what needs to happen to the layout of those lots and the surfacing of those lots and the placement of those dwellings. Um, so in the interim, your development permit area is what it is. There's one guideline that any property owner on Gabriola has to adhere to in order to have that permit issued. And the subdivision process is complex, very detail-oriented, and specifically catered to ensuring that the interagency cooperation happens, including First Nations being involved at the provincial level and as part of our referral process to um, hopefully have the best final outcome for that particular part in its future, which has been decided through a rezoning application that was approved by an LTC multiple years ago. So, but as this LTC has written, the conditions have changed to the Declaration Act mm -hmm. that has come into law and our own reconciliation declaration have changed the conditions under which we do use <laughs> planning. And the very recent decision by the James Island Provincial Approving Officer, which is in the North Pender LTC, declared for the first time that Indigenous rights and title and core concerns and their interests must be considered, not in our referral process and in our permitting structure, but as a higher order many magnitudes higher of, of, uh, of importance. And, and that LTC wrote of its objections, and that was considered in the decision, which ultimately rejected the subdivision that would have seen an island turned into 79 party lots, the golf course. So I understand we're not talking about that uh, subdivision right now, but my question to the applicant is why, um, why do you need to do tree removal right now when you don't have a subdivision plan to present? Uh, we don't need to do tree removal right now. Our intention is to, and as always, very carefully, very thoughtfully, if we have to remove any trees, that's what we will do within the bounds of all the guidelines and and our conscientious behavior. And there are we we we're in constant contact with Sinema hmm. weekly. It's not what you said last time. Pardon? That's not what you said last meeting. What did I say last meeting? You week? said that they've been very difficult and you've only been able to get a hold of one person. Yes. Earl Manson. And in the last couple of years. You know, Earl Manson is the one who was on site for this last day I knew that we did extensively okay. over the whole property. He was the overseer and representative for your um, t-shirts um, group there. And uh, he, he, his, his actual comment was, I don't understand why we're doing this. So nothing was found. The holes were done with an excavator. So it, it went far beyond what we needed to do. The report has been approved by archaeolo the archaeological people in uh, Victoria. And um, this we're doing 
because we're required to get the steep slopes permit. And these numbers are outside numbers, possibly the same as the numbers, it's the same company that you use for the 707. So we use the same company because that's the trust approved company. So you, we assume, so we went to the expense of using the same company. These are outside numbers, possible outside numbers. We have really no idea how many trees that we're going to take down or not take down. That's, that's a metric. And we have never logged the property. There, there is, there's no commercial trees on our property. Um, it, it's, it, our property was logged twice before we received it. And, and there's, there's, there's nothing to log on our property. Yes, there's trees to take down. But it's it's not like the logging operation that took place on. Something. So you're clarifying that taking down trees is not logging. Is that what you're saying? Did you roll your eyes at me? Okay. No, I'm asking. I believe you just rolled your eyes at me, and it I don't appreciate it. This is very intimidating. Okay. This is very intimidating. I I understand. I can right? see that how we are responding is affecting you. Okay, but let's just take a breath and try to be objective. And um, I'm not sure that the, the line of inquiry here is actually supporting the decision that's on the table here. I would quite frankly like to avoid the word subdivision because subdivision is not on the table today. So could we talk about unauthorized works, including the disturbance of some artifacts? Sure. But uh, yeah, the, the, the potential for that discussion exists. And I'm collecting my thoughts here. Because the other thing I didn't want to talk about is the James Island subdivision. That decision and the, and the report from the approving officer was about a subdivision, not a development. And so we can't mix these things up. We have to be focused and clear because this is a delicate matter um, of which absolutely the potential, you know, I'm totally in support of uh, Sanemo First Nations rights and title, the, the history here, and absolutely don't want to see an archeological site disturbed. I am prepared to believe that the property owner also doesn't want to do that, right? And that's, Certainly obvious in work that has happened up to this point with respect to the communication with the art branch and the covenant and all this kind of stuff. But guess what? I don't think that's on the table here today either. The applicant, right or wrong, from a lens today on where we're at with uh, wanting to acknowledge and work with First Nations, is within their rights to apply for development fair experiment regardless of what is their ultimate intentions are. And they provided us with the reporting that's necessary to support that. I have some additional thoughts here as we advance through this, but at the moment, I just want to focus on what our authority is. And I, I won't disagree with you, Toby, that I'm just as uncomfortable with advancing this without the, uh, the name of First Nation supporting it, but it's not supported in our legislation, if I'm not mistaken. And so let's focus on these two areas, B and D, and I really thank you for identifying for me and clarifying that area B is a, is a particular location where it's much more problematic. And obviously that conversation has been had with the art branch. And I just want to be, I want to be spell this out in black and white mostly. The covenant is with the art branch, it's not with us. Is that correct? It will be after the subdivision process. There are intended to be additional covenants registered yeah. on currently the local trust committee has covenant registered on title. That's why the rezoning application would yeah. be able to be adopted so that there was certainty that this piece wouldn't be forgotten. Once they got to the S stage, so, <laughs> so this is uh, yes, this is 
intended to be addressed at that point in time. And your legislation currently is, as much as no one wants to hear the word administrative in nature, that's exactly what the development permit area is. It's a very limiting, very narrow focus uh, that any property owner in Gabriel can apply for if they fall within its boundaries with no discussion about rationale, no discussion about anything outside of the guideline, mm -hmm. uh, which is a geotech's assurance that the slope stability will not pose any risks to future development. So that's why you passed a resolution recommending that this be added to your project list because it is a woefully inadequate development for an area. Uh, that doesn't say that the rest of them are any better, but there's a, a broader land use planning lens that we know needs to be applied across the whole island so that it doesn't just focus on individual properties as applications come forward. So, you know, this is a and I'm not trying to make any excuses or anything at all, except as you pointed out, it's a woefully inadequate. But that's what we've got. And that could have or should have been dealt with a long time ago. And even the development approval information bylaw, we don't have. And that would have brought us greater ability to ask the applicant to do more than they have done. And what they have done meets the requirements of the development permit requirements. So I also just for clarity, the regulations and the law associated with the archaeological branch and the disturbance of archaeological sites is absolutely clear. If you mess with it, you're going to be in big trouble. And I think you know that. And, and I certainly know that you don't want to do that because obviously that would compromise any future interest in subdivisions. No, we don't we don't want to do it because we respect the sites. Absolutely. Right? I'm a First Nation consultant. Yeah, I'm, I'm not <laughs> questioning them at all. I want to believe, I, I will, I do believe that you will do the right thing because of simply having this conversation. And I'm just wanting to be clear that all of these mechanisms are in place to protect that site, and we are all obligated to ensure that no harm comes of it. And today we're here to discuss a development permit, which um, is within their rights to apply for. They meet it. Um, and I'll, although I have concerns, I have faith that the applicant is going to do the right thing. Um, Can I speak and, to that point? Yeah, so let me just, well, be careful, but, yeah, but just give me a moment here. So with respect to the development permit, presumably we have the opportunity to amend that, even here today, to change some of the characteristics of that, if we get some consent from the applicant to do so. For instance, removing the B area at this time so they can continue on with what other activity they want. If we are, if we can agree that there's a, there's a greater level of protection that is necessary above and beyond what we have the ability. Could we amend that today? This is just a question for staff. It would not be permissive to issue a permit like that unless the applicant is willing to. Absolutely. Because there's no flexibility in a development permit. It's not a very zoning. Yeah, there's no negotiation. Right. So I'm just saying that's a potential. Thing. If this was different, it might be easier for us to get to that place. But at the same time, I don't believe we have. It. And so this comes back down to, you know, so we talked about the layers of, of, of the You know, the trouble is it's very almost one dimension for us. This is the development permit, yes or no, they met the requirements. Essentially, none of us are happy. Probably not one dimensional to enable. Not sure they consider land in the same lens. And they certainly do not agree, I agree with, with the proponent that there is agreement on the ARC sites. The letter from 2021 states that the lands clerk spoke with the ARC branch regarding the proposed project with the history related to the ARC sites. And it's an enables understanding that the branch had believed the proponents/slash owners had placed covenants 
on the ARC sites, but in fact, that was never completed. So this is 2021. And for this LTC to proceed without the assurance that those covenants have been secured and there is agreement between Sarimak and the province that delineates the area of protection, which I understand is still disputed. It is not like saying this tiny area is our sacred area. There has been dispute about what are the bounds of those covenant areas. And so if you're going to believe the proponent's word that they will look after that, there is evidence that Chief Wise said there has been disagreement. The proponent said that these are the covenants replaced, the art branch said they were not. So I would say there's there isn't a lot we can go on unless we see an agreement between the name of and the province on the extent of those arc sites, and then we can proceed with approving a development permit. Those are larger questions that need to be answered, and that is our due diligence. So. But that process is pending. Yes. Our understanding is it's all that would happen once the applicant submits <laughs> that layout, and then that discussion can happen. Until that layout is presented, there's, there's nothing to discuss. Um, because it's all hinging on the layout of those lots. And so that, which is hinging on agreement with the name of it. So I just like assurance that that's in place before we can apply anything else. Our tiny bylaws are <laughs> insignificant compared to. But they are provincial legislation. A development permit area isn't just your local bylaw, it is like a provincial tool that, that the local trust committee at the time enacted and intended to be used and they didn't delegate authority to staff to issue the permits they maintained that authority to issue the permits so it's an uncomfortable situation you're in i get it uh, it is still an administrative tool at this point that's a province is given to the ltc that has adopted it and included it and here we are to point out that this is a provincial statute that is falling out through the land use planning lens that you have to use to allow people to proceed with their development of their lands, which they are intended to do. Um, sure, like I might have a quick question. Um, you might as well ask you uh, yes. to have an answer to the applicant wanting to maybe oh, respond sorry. to some of the questions that yeah. were going around. So, one of yeah, for provide sure. that sorry. opportunity yeah. fairness. And so, sir, did you have something to add? Yes, yeah, sure. I wanted to say. Um, one of the problems here, well, first of all, we we have given the trust a letter of undertaking that they required, where we agreed that at the time of subdivision, we will register the heritage branch covenants. Right. So that's in your file already, right there for you. Uh, number two, the recent AIA that was done was done at the request of the first mission. Uh, it was conducted on the entire site. No sites were discovered. That report was submitted to the heritage branch that accepted that report. All of that goes to Ministry of Transportation before any subdivision could get it. Yeah. So, uh, in addition to that, um, my concern about this is you have one letter from the First Nation that you pull out and point to where they've alleged certain conduct on our part. You have none of the correspondence some that we've written to them, the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, you don't have a copy of the Heritage Branch investigation that came as a result of their complaint, where they clarified that we had done no damage to any site. In fact, they commended us on how much we were protecting us. Uh, who commands so, the art branch? The heritage branch. Of course, we came, did their full inspection, and gave frankly a pretty supportive report about our care for the site. Um, so you know, I, I'm a little bit um, concerned that one letter from 2020 from the First Nation uh, is some guideline for you to suggest that we have. That they're correcting what they said because they were, they were totally incorrect. In fact, they came on the site and we gave them a tour of every site on the property 
and you've never heard a complaint since that day. So there's a big paradigm shift between what you're perceiving as our behavior or their interests and what we're doing every day with the Ministry of Transportation right now as we speak. You know, we're preparing correspondence with respect to the covenant. So I, I happen to have this because I've done full time on the covenant. The issue you raised there, the first nation the saying this, we said covenants were registered and they weren't. I have a volume of correspondence that addresses that with the Ministry of Transportation. It was never agreed to register a covenant until the final lot layout was approved. So we put the covenant on the right lot that contained the site. That's all we clarified with the Ministry of Transportation with the Harrison Frank. So their understanding of that was incorrect. And you don't have that correspondence. Um, so you're missing a lot of correspondence of our work, both with the First Nation and with the Heritage Branch and with the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, so I, I want to say this, that the area of the B you're talking about is up on the north east northwest corner of the site where there's some burial site on the bottom and uh, it's it says there that's not I, I think there is some steep slope they're very small portion of it 179 trees there is the maximum amount of trees based on 600 stems per hectare which is what is the standard for a healthy forest on the Israel so one perception is even if we took all of those trees, which would never happen, it's in line with the guidelines to create a healthy forest in April. We have too much overgrowth in some of these things. That's not the question. The question is how are the cultural sites um, protected? Well, it's, I, it's not okay, well, great We undertake and provide covenants. The draft covenant has been accepted by the heritage branch. It can't be registered until the lots are actually created. So you put it on a lot that has a site. Under the Heritage Branch regulations, we're not allowed to disturb anything with any of these archaeological sites without a Heritage Act permit. And if we get that permit, it will require First Nations uh, on-site supervision, just like our last AI AIDA did with the First Nations. Uh, you, you haven't got a letter to the First Nations saying, gee, we, we went to this AIA for three days and did this report. And, and we found a bunch of things we have concerns because there, there were no concerns. There's always a risk so, so that you might find a further site. So when now we're getting into your word against the name of, and I'd like to avoid that because well, then, I heard then, the exact opposite when I talked to. You know, I want to avoid it. Why is this that you talked to them last week? To whom did you speak? I'm not going to name names, but if oh, no, 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 you, this is no, no, no. Your public uh, representative Manson told me on the phone that there has always been concern and they remain opposed to any development in that area. And she was going to call a meeting of the elders to talk about this issue and she forwarded it to chief and council. Let, there me, is, let me respond to you. We're in the middle of discussions with the First Nation about their interest in buying all or part of our land. Right. This has been going on for yeah, 15 yeah. years, the third time. We're waiting for a response from we we sent them a layout, a whole bunch of different options, what they could take. You know, we put all the sites on one lot and they could have that lot. Right? They want to buy it all, buy it all. That's where we're at with First Nations. So I have to say to you, I'm uncomfortable that we're out of this post. That you talk to the First Nations. We have no need to discuss. We have no opportunity to express. I'd be happy to have you have a meeting with Joe B. and us sit in the room and we'll bring our paperwork Absolutely. and we'll see. We'll see Let's what's right. That. But all of this to me is, I mean, to say, you've already made your mind up that somehow we're doing something wrong that's affecting the First Nation, all based on one letter and a phone call with Geraldine. So I can give you probably a foot high of communications with every agency outside of yours, who I understood had the authority and jurisdiction to approve a subdivision, protect the sites. And now you're saying to me, you, you want to somehow protect it by not giving a development permit while we're working with all these other higher agencies to talk about it, complying with every single criteria that ever asked. 
And if the First Nations have an objection, they should make it to MOTI. And, and if they do, they will. And that'll be part of the television process, and we'll deal with it. But let me make it clear to you. There are only eight sites on our front. Eight. Of all the many sites, they've all been totally destroyed by previous logging. That's, that doesn't mean they're not still special sites, but they're destroyed. Five of the sites, the petroglyph site, the three burial sites, and a large midden site are all on a bluff. They're all going to be on the one lot that we created to do this. They're all going to have covenants. And no trees within those areas can be taken without a permit. So I have to say, I think this is all about nothing. And if the First Nation had objected, hey, we've been in this process now for a long time with the First Nation and with MOTR. And it's it's going to happen soon. We'll find out if they really have an objection. We can't get them to tell us what their objection is, other than what you said, which is just just some thing in the sky. Something in the sky. Really, something in the sky. Really. Yeah. Oh, because they, they they will not tell us. You know, listen. They're the ones that said in writing that they wanted an updated AIA. Because they said the testing spacing of the previous report wasn't sufficient. We got that report. They were there. It's been submitted. It's been accepted. So we satisfied the last request they had. We don't know what else they're concerned about other than this general theory that they really don't want this summons to occur because they want to either control the property or own it. Fine. And we're having that discussion. But if they don't end up wanting to buy us, and we don't want to sell them, we're going to sell them money. And we'll go through all the hoops in the subdivision process that everybody throws at us. But to suggest we can't have 14 homes on 115 acres because there's four destroyed midden sites, a phenomenal petroglyph, a couple of burial sites that are all going to be protected, that's a hard, that's a hard one to swallow. You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. Gabriela TV needs volunteers to get our programming up in the air. Recently, Teresa spoke with local resident Zulis Yelte about why she volunteered with us. Hi, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Why'd you come out to the event today? Well, I was really happy that um, Frank had um, spearheaded this initiative and was very interested to see what perspective and what approach um, the group was going to take in terms of Gabriola News and what focus the group had. How needed do you think uh, a local journalism initiative is? How, how needed is it here in Gabriel? I think it's very needed because what we have is superficial, uh, feel good. Um, you know, the latest uh, artist or whatever. Um, uh, but there's not the depth that, especially since um, the flying shingle. Uh, Chris uh, was a, a more critical thinker and more in depth with the woman who ran this uh, other little paper. I see. Um, uh, so she would uh, present, you know, the critical view and get into the depth of what's going on here and call people into account. And we need that because organizations are running with a half a million dollars and amongst themselves their board and all of all of that but um, uh, I don't see public accountability happening. Why is it important do you think for us to be really delving deeply into these things? Uh, because um, there are um, all kinds of critical issues from housing and health and racism, trans and homophobia, and uh, only the glossy stuff gets looked at, the superficial, nice island, great tourist place to come to, but not the real 
um, on the ground, life uh, day to day um, of people uh, sleeping out because they have no money, including seniors now in their vans or whatever. Um, so there are dire circumstances that are right before our eyes that we uh, don't know about because, you know, we're asleep basically, glossing over things. What's important for you? What's the most important issue at the top of your mind? Right now, um, racism and trans and homophobia, it's come to the fore. Um, there are increasing numbers of people of um, non-white races and here on the island and they're being treated abysmally and that cannot happen as well as the homelessness uh, and uh, people in dire straits financially and needing food. Uh, it sounds like the island has a lot of the same issues that the big cities have really. It's a microcosm, yeah, that's for sure, of, of the larger world. Uh, we have all the same issues, absolutely. Uh, but we really need to st uh, st uh, take our head out of the sand, I guess, and, and deal with it. I mean, I, I haven't been proactive. Um, you know, I lost my spouse uh, four years ago now, but it's taken me a long time to get myself together again. And now I am waking up and get my feet on the ground and my strengths again and it's like we've got to change uh, the way we're doing things and uh, make make some real strides uh, some effective um, positive um, I, I don't know enterprises to assist people and to um, educate people uh, uh, as well around, I'm thinking around the racism, homophobia issue, but. And why did you come today to volunteer? What's, what's driving that decision to come and volunteer with us? Um, I care about this community. Uh, I have a lot of um, uh, skills and abilities and a good mind still and um, I think I have something to contribute that could be helpful and I don't see enough being done to uh, bring forward the concerns that not only I but so many of us have. Well that's great thank you so much. Thank you too and thanks for coming to the island and I look forward to stirring up the pots. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> you are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. Since that interview, a new diversity group has formed on the island as concerned citizens like Zulus focus on racism and prejudice on Gabriola. Well, that's it from us here at Island View. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.